what was the situation in uh, rural Bengal, Nali 40s? Actually, we know in great detail what the situation was in the early 40s because of a very detailed report that was prepared in 1937-38 by a man called Floud. It's famously known as the Floud Commission Report. And a part of the Floud Commission Report was a special supplement that was put in there by the representatives of the Krishak Proja Party, which was talking about the condition of the peasants and of the countryside. And there we find the, the real picture of what was going on in, in, in rural Bengal. The extent of sub infudation the layers of rights that existed between the original owner and the cultivator. Sometime that layer could be as many as 40 or 30 layers of rights existed. So that was one. The level of usury and indebtedness that existed, the high rates of interest, and of course declining cultivation the, from land. Land was yielding much less than what it used to. So there was growing landlessness as well. Uh, so the countryside, the conditions of the countryside were pretty miserable by the time we can enter the decade of the decade of the 1940s. Uh, how was the situation in Bengal in terms of war, threat of Japanese invasion and the cyclone in 42? Well, that there would be a Japanese invasion was a very widely per perceived reality. Uh, you must, we must remember at this point that the Japanese were, by 1942-43, certainly at the borders of India, in the northeast as well as on the Burmese border. So the eastern districts of Bengal were, the most eastern districts of Bengal, were certainly under threat of an imminent Japanese invasion. And then came the bombings of Calcutta. There were three air, at least three air raids in which Calcutta was bombed, including the docks and parts of Dalhousie Square and Esplanade and so on. So there was this fear that a Japanese invasion is about to happen, both in terms of air warfare as well as on the movement of landed troops. I don't think this is a factor that can be discounted. Nobody expected that the Allies would win so swiftly uh, in the Eastern Front as they did. And that is largely because of America's entry into the war. So in 41, when all this is taking place, there is no indication that Roosevelt is going to actually enter the war, actually enter the war. There was support coming in terms of resources, in terms of food supplies, ammunition, etc. But that the U.S. would actually enter the war was not certainly not a fait accompli. It becomes a fait accompli in 1942. And that's when the situation begins to change a few months after that. The situation begins to change in Europe as well as in Asia. But before that, this is a very strong perceived fear that this, the Japanese are at our doors and very soon they will be in Calcutta. So, and as, as you will, as we know, and you can find out also, many middle class, upper middle class families actually evacuated from Calcutta into parts of the Santal Parganas, what is today Charkhand and Bihar. They rented houses in Modhupur and places like that and moved there. I know some members of my family did that as well. So, this so that was the perceived threat. So I don't think we should underestimate that. It's very easy to underestimate, be, underestimate it because we now know the result of the war. But if you place yourself in 1941-42, then the perceptions, the emotions were different than looking at it from a vic victorious point of view as it were. So 
it was a very very real threat that people said could happen any day and in the case of bengal of course this gets a separate and a different emotional dimension because of subhash bose's involvement with the japanese so this is not just going to be a threat this is also going to be a liberation it has that threat contains within it the potentials of a liberation as well so there is expectation and there is fear but the fear is not just among the people the greater fear is among the administrators the british really feel at this point of time because the tide of war in europe as well as in asia is going against them they seriously believe that their possessions in india might fall to the japanese so they are also thinking of ways in which the japanese threat can be encountered the japanese threat can be fought back and resisted why the british government introduced the scotch dart policy in the it's world? precisely because of the perceived threat that i was talking about they believe that the japanese are, are going to invade and we should create conditions on the ground in bengal so that life becomes difficult for them so their supply lines will be cut off they will not have food for their troops so that is why you introduce a policy like scotch tar withdraw boats so that they cannot use them for transport this is a riverine tract where boats are very important so make it difficult take away the logistic support the supply line support make it difficult for them so that when they invade bengal come into bengal they will find it very difficult to move their troops and that will also give the british time to prepare and resist it was a deliberate policy and it is it is not an unknown policy many countries when they face we know from history many countries when they face invasions this is the policy that they follow they when they retreat they burn and retreat so that the invading enemy cannot take advantage of the food water uh, you know and uh, an infrastructure so i mean the consequences of the cyclone are very predictable i mean homes had been destroyed crops had been destroyed damaged at least if not destroyed homes certainly had been had been destroyed so people were looking for shelter so and as as we also know from historical experience when this kind of a natural calamity happens it is always the poorest in the population that are the hardest hit and so already in depressed conditions that i have described in answer to your previous question about what conditions existed in rural bengal so already under depressed condition the common people of bengal particularly the landless peasantry and the small holding peasant were very seriously affected by the cyclone by the loss of their livelihood loss of their homes and sometimes in some cases even loss of their families as well because of the natural calamity level as the cyclone was indeed there is the cyclone and in the wake of that comes shortage of food now that shortage of food is not a direct result of the lack of production there was no absolute shortage of food in bengal it's not that the agricultural productivity had become zero or had fallen drastically recent research both by amartya sen and manjushri bukaji have shown very clearly that there was enough food that was available okay there were pockets of scarcity but any government could have allowed the transport of food from areas of plenty to areas of scarcity 
the British government, because it saw itself as being under threat of a Japanese invasion and had already was following what has been called the Scotch Tart policy and also had appropriated boats, there were not enough transport available to move food from areas of plenty to areas of scarcity. And this is what created famine conditions. It's not the absolute scarcity of food that created famine conditions. So it was an, as Satyajit Ray showed in the film, Osheni Shanket, Distant Thunder, it was an artificially created man-made shortage of food. So it is a man-made famine. It is not a famine caused by the natural, caused by the decline of agricultural productivity because of natural causes. So there are two factors that are operating that create these terrible conditions. One is the cyclone which has happened the year before and the second is the policy that we will not move food to scarce areas. So the, the war cabinet, they turned down all the offers? Yes. By Australia? Yes, for them, for them what was more important was the war rather than the lives of common people, lives of peasants in Bengal. What is important for us to remember is that this is not India's war. No Indian was ever asked if India wants to become part of the Allied war effort. The British government decided unilaterally that India was part of the war effort. This was not our war. This was not India's war. The Indian National Congress, particularly Nehru, made this point again and again from 1939. Yes, fascism is a real threat, both in Asia in the form of Japan, as well as Italy and Germany in Europe. But India has to decide how to, whether it wants to combat fascism and in what way it should combat fascism. The British can't decide for Indians. The British decided for India and made India part of the war. So young Indians died in the war in millions in Europe and in Asia, in Burma particularly, and tens of thousands of poor peasants in Bengal died because of a certain policy that the British followed because that they thought a Japanese invasion was imminent and they had to take steps to resist that invasion. There is one other point, though you haven't asked me this question, but I want to make this point because it is very important to understand, to make this point to understand a certain strand of development of Bengali culture and Bengali consciousness. 1943 is the first time that middle class, upper middle class, Calcuttans, people who lived in Calcutta, in areas like where we are in Baliganj, in Alipur, in Shambhajar, it's the first time that they encountered death because hungry, starving people from the villages came to Calcutta looking for food, begging for food. Not, they were not begging for rice. They were actually begging for the boiled water, pan, we call it in Bengal. Pan dao goma, that was the cry in the streets of Calcutta. They wanted that boiled water for survival. And they died in thousands on the pavements. This is the first time that middle class, intelligentsia, educated people saw death physically how the poor die, they saw it and it left a mark on the consciousness of the people. Only in this context can we understand how a play like Nobanno 
which is a landmark production in the history of Bengali, modern Bengali theatre, takes place in 1944. It is in this context that it, we can understand the art of Somnath Ho, the poetry of Shomo Shen, the poetry of Vishnu Dev. Otherwise, we do not know. We wouldn't. This is the context on, from which this generation, the radical generation, as if the post Tagore radical generation, this is the context in which their consciousness comes to being, as it were. And this happens in 43, 44, and in 46 happens the great killing of Calcutta, the communal riot. So, and then in 47, the migration of the population. So, these three great episodes in the history of Bengal, the famine, man-made famine, I emphasize again, the great Calcutta killing, and the partition. These three have formed the consciousness of the Bengali people, particularly of the Bengali intelligentsia. So one should not just see the famine in isolation. Of course it's important, it needs to be seen in isolation, but it is also a part of a tragic series. How can we today, how can we explain the British government's responsibilities, like total responsibility for the heavy dead toll well, this is the crisis of imperialism, that what is more important, my empire or people? And for them the choice was obvious, they felt their empire was more important. For us, the choice is different. The lives of people are much more important than the naked priorities of power. And the lesson to draw from this is there are regimes of power even today and there are regimes of power of various ideologies even claiming to be left that see power to be more important than people. So you, it is very pertinent at this point in the context of the dilemma that European radicals, European intelligentsia face today in Europe because of the migration of people. Enough has been written about it in scholarly books. I think this needs to be written about in a, in a popular way to make it more accessible to the intelligent lay woman. You know, Bernard Shaw coined this phrase, the inte intelligent woman's guide to socialism. So I think common intelligent people who are not students of history, but who also should know about the past, want to know about the past, an episode like the famine, an episode like the great communal killing of Calcutta, the partition, the migration of people, populations from East Pakistan to Bengal, these things need to be registered in the popular consciousness. So in a sense, I'm very glad that this film, this do you're making a film like this because it will reach out to a wider audience than a scholarly book or a scholarly article can. It's difficult also to touch the icon of, icon image of Churchill also. Maybe. Well, that's the problem of the Britisher. It's not our problem. Churchill was a die-hard imperialist. He hated everything Indian, including Gandhi. It is said that when the news went to him that Gandhi had been assassinated, he said, far too late. So that's the kind of man he was. Indians did not matter to him. So, for us, he's not an icon. Maybe for the Britisher or the Englishman, he's an icon. But even the Britishers are beginning to realize that Churchill also was a hero with his feet in clay.